It is a huge, huge honor for me to have my granddaughter Taylor introduce her first podcast. Say hi, David. Hi, Taylor. <laughs> it's always the best uh, days when uh, Taylor spends like, Taylor, do you want to ask him a question? No, she doesn't. Okay, I'll let you go play. So, David, how are you doing? Howard, I'm doing great. Now, you got, you got into all of this because uh, financial freedom, because you, uh, you needed more income for your daughter, correct? Well, I needed a way to what I call break the chains from being at the dental chair four or five days a week running the practice so I could spend more time with my daughter. So, yes. Wow. Well, um, I'm sure everybody knows you. You've got uh, what? You've posted, the, what, 70 podcasts on Dental Town? I think somewhere in that number, yeah. Yeah, thank you for doing that. We started that podcast section. I actually started doing podcasts to uh, to just to start that section on Dental Town. Like I, I made that first post yep. on uh, the message boards in 98, and now there's uh, 215,000 other dentists who have posted 4 million times. I started this podcast to start that section, and now there's a dozen amazing podcasters on Dental Town. And if you've never listened to uh, David, just go to your Dental Town app, and if you go to the app, uh, there's 215,000 dentists on the site. 50,000 of them have downloaded this app. And there's a, the little hash marks on the right. You push that, and there's the podcast. And uh, there are so many dentists telling me how big of fans they are of your show. So I've been dying to get you on. Where Where is he at right here? I'll scroll down. Here it is right there. And you just hit the little uh, button there. And David, it sounds like everybody is using this to commute to work. Yep. And, and I think the reason these podcasts have gone viral um, lately is because of all the, uh, you turn on the television and it's just all politics. It's all That's dysfunctional. Right. It's Trump and Hillary and everybody's burned out and fried and they still got a half year to go to this election. So they say uh, podcasts are crushing radio. And uh, I, I don't want to hear another Trump Hillary update. <laughs> no, until, I don't either. Until uh, I, I always, I'm a registered libertarian, so they always say you? I throw my vote away. I, I always vote libertarian, and I'll do it again this time. Uh, but hey, so let me read your bio. You're the founder of the um, freedomfounders.com. Tell them what freedomfounders.com is. What are they going to find if they go to that site? Well, the website will just show you more about the community. Freedom Founders is a community. It's a mastermind community. We meet quarterly in Dallas, and it's all about uh, creating freedom, You know, utilizing, leveraging your practice, but also leveraging the opportunity to build wealth and cash flow outside the practice. So I, I look at it as a, as a twofold. So that's the website, and uh, you can find more about Freedom Founders uh, at and freedomfounders.com. Who's, who's, who's the founder of Freedom Founders? That would be me. So you're you're the you're the founder of it. I am the guy. Unbelievable. So let me read your bio. So uh, private practice dentist, 1983 to 2004, member of the Texas Dental Association and the ADA, owned and operated dental practice remotely, 2006 to 2010, real estate invest investor, 1980 to present, professional practice marketer of the year for Glazer Kennedy Inside Circle. Is that Dan Kennedy? Yeah, that's Dan Kennedy's organization. Man, he used to live out here. That's right. He, he, uh, he used to be out in Phoenix. Uh, Cleveland's his hometown because he likes to harness race. So that's why he sticks it out uh, in Cleveland. Well, get, pass along invitation if he ever wants to be on the show. I'd love, right. love to have him. Um, author from high income to high net worth for dentist in 2014. Acquired portfolio of real estate investments to replace dental practice income in 2004 to present. His hobbies are tennis, snow skiing, bicycling, and travel. Today, owner and founder of FreedomFounders.com, a mastermind for dentists and other professional practice owners, showing them how to create freedom in their lives through real entrepreneurial business formation and passive cash flow independent of their labor in the form of passive real estate investments. David Phelps began investing in real estate in 1980 while attending Baylor College of Dentistry in Dallas. His first joint venture partner was his father, who invested with David in the first rental property David managed. After graduating in 1983, David, who also had a dental practice, began a steady and continuous progression of real estate education and investment. His goal was to create multiple streams of income that would provide for his family for an emergency, for college tuition, and for retirement. 
In 2004, David's daughter Jenna, then 12, was diagnosed with end-stage liver failure, the results of years of chemotherapy and drug therapy to treat leukemia and epileptic seizures. Jenna was fortunate to receive a liver transplant in time to save her life, but the recovery period was long and arduous. During this time, David made the decision to become a true business entrepreneur, transforming his dental practice to enable him to spend more time with Jenna, whether she was sick or well. As a result of his newfound freedom, David began practicing dentistry part-time and subsequently stopped being the provider of dental treatment. He ran his practice remotely for another six years before selling to one of the associate dentists. Today, David is a firm believer that time is our most important asset. He counsels you can't buy your life back at some future retirement age. There is no such thing. It's an illusion that unfortunately escapes too many hardworking people. Freedom is his mantra. He is a crusader for dentists and owners of other professional practices to show them how to achieve the same life that he has engineered. Real estate continues to be his passion as a proven investment vehicle, a subject on which David mentors other enterprising individuals. David's new book, From High Income to High Net Worth, provides owners of professional practices and other small businesses a well-defined blueprint with which to create freedom and options within the scope of their businesses and personal lifestyles. He writes, professional practice and small business owners have simply not been given permission to operate their work and, and live their lives in a lifestyle that was envisioned at the beginning of their careers. I did it because I was forced to do it. Others can do it because they should. David was awarded the coveted Marketer of the Year for Professional Practice Owners at the Glazer Kennedy Super Conference in Chicago in front of 1,200 of his peers. Today, David enjoys the freedom that he created in his own life. He coaches and consults with professional practice and other business owners to show them how to create freedom, security, and peace of mind through the development of true entrepreneurial practices and lifetime passive income streams found in done-for-you real estate investments. He has participated in more than 1,000 real estate transactions and has involved direct bank financing only five times. The remaining 99% of the transactions were done strictly with private financing, which he reminds us is all about financial friends and relationships. He says, your life is your life, your business is not your life, he says. Learn to live life on your own terms and accept nothing less. David's life can be celebrated as proof that adversity can open doors to opportunity until we are uncomfortable enough in our present situation, he says, change is not likely to happen. So we're all wondering for the first question is, how's your daughter doing? Well, thanks, Howard. Uh, Jenna's actually doing, doing well right now. She's probably had the most stable period of her, her health history in the last six years. So uh, the first, first uh, 18 years were, were up and down quite a bit. So she's hit, hit a, a peak right now where she's, she's doing well. Right on. Yeah. So, um, Big, big fan of your show. Now, who's the other guy on there? Michael Evans. He's with uh, uh, Evan, Evan Harris. E Evan yeah. Harris. Yeah, yeah. E Evan, Evan actually is not a dentist, but he, uh, he's a Patterson representative, but really also understands the. He's a what representative? Patterson for Patterson. Oh, oh Patterson yeah. Dental. Yeah, he's out in San Diego. Uh, really, really good guy, and he came from a background. His father was a financial planner, so he was hanging out, listening to his dad talk to other business owners about, about, you know, building their financial assets. And so he kind of got into that and, uh, and he does a lot of real estate too. So we connected some years ago and decided to do, to do, to do this together, the podcast. Wow. So does Patterson Dental underwrite all these transactions? They do not. <laughs> <laughs> they do not. <laughs> so what, uh, so, uh, so what are the myths and lies and propaganda of financial freedom? What, what, what does that word mean to you? Yeah, I think it, it's, it all starts back when when we're growing up, Howard. It's 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 the environment. It it could start with our parents. I think you know you were fortunate. You had a father that was very entrepreneurial. But but many believe in the the myth. I think that to to gain freedom in life, you go to school, you work hard. There's nothing wrong with that. But it's all about getting the higher degrees, the higher education, and then getting into a career or a profession, and that that's going to eventually lead you to freedom. And I think we see that. You see that. Uh, it's something that doesn't work out for most people because it's it's really not it's not true. So why how one makes his money is important than how much money he makes? Well, how you make your money, if, if, if making your money is all dependent upon what, what you do, that is your craft, uh, the labor you put into it, uh, then there's limitations on that. And even if you're the highest paid brain surgeon or negotiator, there's still a limit on what you can make. 
And there comes a time when you need to transition, I think, from active labor to having capital assets, owning, controlling capital assets that will provide for you. That way, then you can live your life the way you want to. It doesn't mean you have to quit doing what you love to do if you like doing dentistry or negotiating or whatever it is you do, you do in life uh, to, to satisfy your, your, your needs. But, uh, but you have, if you're dependent upon what you do, uh, then there's never going to be a real freedom point. I, it, it's always, you know, one of my biggest pet peeves in all of my professional career has been that the uh, practice management software doesn't hook up to an accounting software and doctors don't know anything about financial accounting, managerial accounting, nothing. And another one is the fact that they'll say that, well, my overhead's only 65%, the rest is profit. And I'm like, what, what do you mean mm -hmm. profit? Profit is, if, if I put a dollar in a bond, it'll give me a nickel every year for eternity. Um, how much of that profit is uh, capital employed in a dental office making you passive yeah. income profit versus how much are you just getting paid? So if you can hire an associate dentist all day long in Phoenix for 25% of production, then you should pay yourself 25% of production. Then you would see what is, uh, then your overhead wouldn't be 65, maybe be 85 or 90. Right. Then you'd realize that your profit from having capital employed in dental offices is 10%. And then if you switch yourself out and associate, then, you know, so they don't understand profit dollars from wages. Exactly. Um, exactly. So, uh, yeah. yeah. So, so how would, how would you, um, so, so, so you suggest that dentists or chiropractors or physicians or lawyers should have a plan B. Why should they have a plan B and how would they do it? Yeah, I think a plan B is something you have in place whether you think you need to use it or not. In, in my case, I didn't know what a plan B was, but real estate became my plan B because I needed the opportunity to leave practice because of, of my daughter's health situation. If you don't have a plan B, if everything's based on what you do or your one business, you don't have other streams of income, income that you've built up over the years, then what's your, what's your fallback? What's your, what's your safeguard position? Uh, you know, you've done very well, obviously, in, in the one area I know you've done outside of dentistry. Uh, by building out Dental Town, you know, a great platform of, of media. You have sense that. I, I assume that you could do what you want to do in life. You did that on purpose because of, 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 of something you have passion for. Everybody should do that. I just think, I think real estate's a great way to do it if you're not capable of doing that in your business or your practice. Some doctors, some dentists are very good at that. You interview a number of them on podcasts, but many just don't have that mindset. So we take that majority of them that can't do it in their practice and help them do it outside through real estate. You know, you're very romantic to me because uh, my father had nine Sonic drive-ins, but his mentor was Roger Carpenter in Coffeyville, Kansas, who had a hundred Sonic drive-ins. Mm -hmm. And he started out as a teacher and he had two kids. And when one of them got sick, he couldn't afford the medical bills on a teacher's, uh, teacher's income. So that's what forced him to buy his first Sonic drive-in. And of course, that mo mother's a necessity of uh, change. Uh, and then when I, I met up with him, he had a hundred Sonic drive-ins, but it's uh, amazing how um, sometimes uh, hitting rock bottom is the best foundation. Well, I think that's exactly right. I think, I think adversity, if you persist and push through it, and there's you know, lots of ways to do that, but I certainly say don't try to do it by yourself. You need to be surrounded by other people that are, that are, that are like-minded and have an entrepreneurial spirit, but, but hitting rock bottom uh, I think forces people out of that comfort zone. And when you do that, you're forced to make changes. You're forced to look at your life in a different way, a different light, and and, and build those things. So that was surely, certainly my case, Howard. Uh, if not for my daughter's health crisis, I probably would still be in dental practice. Nothing wrong with that, but you know what? I really enjoy the freedom I have in life today because of what I went through because of her health situation. So explain your business model. Or what type of real estate? Are you talking commercial, residential? What? What is your business model in a nutshell? I, I start everybody who's new at, with, with single family because it's easy to evaluate. Uh, a house doesn't have a lot of moving parts. You can certainly make money in the other asset classes, commercial, multifamily, and we deal in mobile home parks and apartments. But as far as just learning basic financial concepts and not getting hurt, I think single family is, is the best way to go. Uh, so, the, so the model is, is to, to learn the, the nuts and bolts of single family by, by doing what I call one-to-one -one secured investments where someone can learn how to lend their money, uh, be, like being the bank, which is control without ownership. A lot of people get are afraid of dealing with tenants and contractors and, and toilets, and I get that. So learning how to lend money and see how that works, uh, and then certainly learning how to, to leverage if one wants to build wealth and their estate 
faster to leverage uh, into the proper real estate using the, the low interest rates we have today, which is an opportunity, I think, of a lifetime if you do it the right way. And then once you, once you build a base and you, you have some confidence in, and you have more propensity for what you're doing in real estate, certainly you can, you can migrate to, to the other classes. But on you know, single family, there's just, you, you don't have to be smarter than a whole lot of other people. In, in commercial, you're dealing with people that have probably been around the block a few times and you get in that arena by yourself, you're probably going to get eaten up pretty quickly. Okay, I'm um, sorry to point out our ages, but we're both in our 50s, and I hear the dental students and the young dentists under 30 on Dental Town saying that they don't want to buy a practice mm -hmm. that has real estate because they just lived through the 2008 yeah. crash. So totally. if, if you went out and told your neighbor right now you were going to get into real estate, they, they're still at 2016, eight years after that collapse, right. would say, have you lost your mind? What, yep. what, what do you say to those guys? Have you yeah. lost your mind, David? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, no, I totally get it. I, I get it from their standpoint, both both the young people you know, and uh, and people maybe a little bit older than we are that, that have their homes and now they're, they're, they're past their prime as far as active income. But what, what history tells us, Howard, is there are always economic cycles. The markets always cycle. And yes, did we have a bad one in, back in 2008, 2009? Absolutely, we did. But, but you're either an investor or you're a speculator. And the people, and, and a lot of people were speculating on their own home, their residence, because you know, anybody who could fog a mirror could, could get a loan back prior to, to the downturn. And so there was a lot of speculation in the market. The market, the market has a lot, of, uh, a lot of government interference and subsidization in it. So you have to be aware of that marketplace. And we're at an, I think we're at another peak right now. I think the market is, 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 is very hot right now. And it doesn't mean you can't invest, but you have to be very careful about it and not get caught up like a lot of people did back in 2008 before the downturn. So, so, how, so some dentist is listening to us to you and they're trained in math and chemistry and physics and biology. How, how does one go about learning um, real estate to the level that they understand root canals, fillings, and crowns? Well, I think, first of all, they're, they're, they're probably not going to learn it to that extent. That's probably the biggest downside to what, how we're built. We're built to, to want to learn everything to the nth degree and control everything, and that's an attribute to what we do. But if you try to do that with everything in life, Howard, there's just too much information out there. So I think the fast track with anything in life, whether that's dentistry or learning real estate, something that's maybe new to you or you want to learn better, is, is you apprentice. You know, you apprentice, you get a mentor, you learn by, by working with, doing things to other people who have already gone ahead of you and are willing to give back and show you what the fast track is. That's, to me, the quickest way, but, you know, that's not how we're built. We're built to be, uh, you know, very rugged individualists. We want to go out and take on the world ourselves because we're smart enough, we're, we'll work hard enough and do it. And, and, and that's, there's a benefit there, but there's also that downside. So I don't think you want to go out and try to get the PhD because if you do that, it's going to take you too long. You, you're not going to get there. You just, you've got to get involved, but get involved with people that you know, like, and trust. You learn to do due diligence. You need to underwrite and know what, what people are about, understand their culture. And then there's other protective mechanisms you can utilize when you're investing that don't leave you out there just hanging you on a thread whereby someone can you know, take your money like happens to just about everybody who tries to invest in areas that they don't understand. So how does uh, how do they find a mentor? Well, I think that's 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 part of what what each individual's job is. You've got to you've got to be out there. I mean, I'll just just push back to Dentaltown. There are a lot of smart smart people on Dentaltown, and and you created that community as a real asset to our profession. So you go there, you you read, you see what people. You see what people say, you see how they respond to other people, you, you get an idea, is this person someone who I can believe in, I can trust, they seem to know what they're talking about. I mean, that's one quick way, Dentaltown right there. There's other communities, whether you go there in live, you find other mastermind groups, but you've, you've, got, to, you've got to do the work. You've got to do the legwork uh, in anything in your life. Uh, too many people don't do that. They find one person who they, they give, give everything to and say, well, I'll just do the dentistry and get really good at that. and here, a financial advisor or someone, here, you take my money and you go invest it. Well, I don't think that's the right way to do it. You've got to have some responsibility for everything in your life, but you can't know it all. So finding the right people, you've, just got, you've got to get out there. You've got to participate uh, and find those groups where you can find those people. And then you find one good person, and then they know six other people who might plug you into the next person. That's the way the world, world works. Your, your network is really your net worth. That's what it's all about today. Explain that in detail, what, that your net worth is equal to your network. Yeah, well, what I, what I say is it's, it's, not, it's not what you do. 
you know, people, again, going back to the myths and propaganda is, is there's nothing wrong with hard work and labor and the work ethic that most of us were built, grew up with. But if that's where you're dependent upon just doing what you do, then you're missing the boat. I do, I, I gain so much more through my relationships with other smart people in vastly different areas than, than I'm involved in. Uh, and then even in my own real estate sector, you know, I don't go out and buy my own houses and do my own rehabs and put my own tenants in. I invest through other people because that's the fast track. I take participations. You know, find someone else that, that you want to invest in with their business or their practice or real estate. Find someone who's really good at what they do and ride with them. Don't try to reinvent the wheel or go into markets that you don't understand unless you have time and propensity to do that. I've been doing this for 35 years, so I pretty well understand it. But if you want to fast track, you've got to find the right people. So your, your network, your relationships, your connection to other smart people, that's what's going to drive you faster to your goal. Again, I'll just go back to dental town. You go to dental town, you're going to find so much wisdom there that will help fast track you to where you want to go in your life and your practice so much more than, than formal education, which, is, which was really just our license to get our foot in the door. But it never stops there. You've got to be continually learning and networking with other people throughout your whole life if you want to ever gain what I call real freedom. They always say it's not what you know, it's who you know. Exactly. Work, yeah. So building your network. Um, I, I sense one of the things that uh, people have a problem with is debt. You know, they, they're always talking about they come out of school. Well, I got $350,000 student loan. I want to pay that off. I don't want to borrow 500000 for an office. When a lot of people think about real estate investing, they think, David, I don't want a bunch of debt. I, I, I want to get out of debt. And, and, yeah. and so t talk about debt. And they also mix debt with personal consumption debt mm -hmm. on their own yep. house and boat yep. and cars versus you know, income, you know, you know, so talk about other people's money, debt. Sure, yeah, no, you, I think you, you put it well hit it there. You know, I'm, I think Dave Ramsey does a great service for the masses out there, people who have no idea the difference between what I call good debt and bad debt. Bad debt being what you just said, consumption debt, you know, uh, extending your lifestyle beyond your means, uh, thinking you need to have it all today. Uh, credit is easy. To get out there, so so you deserve it. So go buy the big house and, and lease the big cars and have the vacations and have all this stuff today because you deserve it. Well, that's bad debt. And Dave Ramsey helps people turn that off and learn how what real budgeting is for people who already have some discipline in their life. Good debt, and that is leveraging your way into capital assets, which could be a good business, business uh, an excellent business. It's a real business. It could be those Sonic drive-ins that your dad got involved in. It could be real estate. Anything that can produce. Capital, produce capital, cash flow, build net worth is, is, is good debt. And if you try to save up enough money to buy a business or a practice or a sonic drive-in or a single family house as a real estate, you're gonna, it's gonna take you a long time to save that money up because we, we, have, we have taxation that works against us. We have inflation that keeps the price points going up. Learning how to leverage the right way is, is a key to controlling those assets early on, but making sure you always have a real business or a, a real investment provides cash flow well beyond what the, what the debt service is and the, the cost of holding that asset. Uh, that's the key, in my opinion, to real estate investing. It's got to cash flow with a solid margin. That's how I keep myself safe, even in a marketplace today that I think is in a bubble. You know, how do I decide what's a good investment and what's not? Well, I look at the cash flow relative to the debt and the holding costs. You know, it's easy for me to evaluate that on a single family house. You put me into other businesses besides dentistry, you know, I'm not going to know that so well. So you've got to, you've got to understand what you're investing in. If you understand that, that asset, then leverage is the way to go. Now, if you come out of school with a lot of debt, I, I get it. I get, I get being averse to more debt. So I don't think I would tell a dental student who comes out of school with $300,000 of debt to go out and leverage into a practice. I think that's the, now's the time to learn how to get your, your feet on the ground, learn some business principles, uh, learn, get your clinical skills up. And then maybe at the right time, you know, you, you can leverage. But, you know, the debt's a big, a big problem today for, for graduates uh, in, in all arenas. It's, it's a huge problem. You mentioned Dave Ramsey uh, a couple times. A lot of our listeners might know who Dave Ramsey is. Mm -hmm. why, why do you recommend Dave Ramsey's? Well, I, I, rec I recommend him because I think Dave is very good about talking to the masses about why consumptive debt is bad. Uh, Dave, Dave, you know, Dave's story is he was also in real estate. You know, you probably know his stories too as well. Uh, he got burned in real estate many years ago, so he is very averse to debt. Uh, I applaud him for helping people get out of consumptive debt, but I, I don't think he can speak to out of both sides of his mouth and really serve his clients. I think if you really got Dave down to a one-on-one -on -one discussion, he would agree that there is good debt, but he doesn't want to mix the message 
out there on, on his platform because he knew it confused people. But as far as a guy who understands business and good debt versus bad debt, I think they're going to talk about leveraging in the real estate because he's helping people get out of, out of uh, personal consumptive debt and buying two houses too big. That's not, that's not his area where he tries to help people. So you just have to understand where people are coming from. Look, look at their advice. Understand who they're speaking to, and, and you know, take what makes sense. But I, and I never buy into every anybody who 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 speaks from a broad, broad platform. You've got to just decide for yourself. You know, what is this person speaking about? Is it relevant to me to who I am? So, talk about your book. Uh, writing a book is like having a child. Um, you wrote a book <laughs> from high income to high net worth for dentists in 2014. Uh, t talk about that book. Yeah, the the premise, whole, the premise of the book is what we're talking about today. Is is that in dentistry and other highly skilled professionals, we learn how, and, and we're given the ability and the license to earn a pretty good income, an average, above average income. But that's like being on a treadmill. Again, is, when you're not working, the income stops. You try to take a vacation for, let's say you try to take, try to leave your practice for three months. And I always tell, I always test, test doctors with their practice, say, well, try to leave it for three months, come back and tell me, is the practice still viable? Is there more money in the bank than when you left, or, or is it cratering? Well, if that's the case, you don't have a real business. You have a business that's dependent upon you. So going from high income and transferring that to a real business or other capital assets like real estate is where you start to build up real net worth equity that has cash flow to it. That's where you start to build up freedom. That's what allows you to, to have a plan B, to decide how much more you want to work. And I think the problem that too many people have is they have this idea that in life, you go to school, you get out, and you, you start your career profession, and there's this time span of 30, 35, 40 years where you just go to work, grind it out, and hopefully you save up enough money so you can, quote, retire. I said, well, what's this retirement thing all about? I mean, today people are living till their 90s and 100 years old. My grandfather lived to 98. I'm planning on doing the same thing, but I don't need to be doing the same thing, working hard laboriously my whole life. Why can't I live my life in phases? So the whole book premise is about, about building that plan B and giving yourself freedom so that you can practice until you're 75 years old if that's what you love to do, but maybe not four days a week. Maybe you do it a day and a half. Maybe you, you learn how to run a real business and you help mentor younger doctors who, who need the help. There's so many different ways to run your life, and I just think it's too many of us, you know, and I was, was one of those that just got channeled into this thinking that you just grind it out for 40 years and somehow it would all be good at the end, but that's not a plan. I mean, that's too many people, you lose, lose opportunities to, to, to create memories and spend time with their families and their kids and their, their parents and people who are important to them. They get to that, that age of, of quote, retirement, 65 or 70 years old, and the people they want to do stuff with can't do it anymore. They're not, they're not around. They're not capable. So it's all about creating a freedom blueprint. I, I'm, just, I'm so big about helping people go through that sacrifice period in their life, wherever that is, the first five years, and start transitioning quickly to have that passive income so you can start living a life. And then you get to decide and not be like so many dentists that we know that are 65, 70 years old and wondering how the heck do I exit? They're afraid to exit. Why are they afraid to exit, Howard? Because, because as long as they're still working in the practice, they know they can at least generate some income. But once they leave practice, they sell out, they don't know how to take what, what they have left and orchestrate it into investments and produce cash flow. They're afraid to death to leave. You see it all, I see it all the time. They, you know, they can't leave. It's funny because they, they so, you know, the popular uh, bad guy is to blame all their woes on his corporate dentistry when I think it's really switching from indemnity fee for service to PPOs with a 40% reduced yeah. fee schedule. Uh, but the, uh, the, the corporates are hiring all the graduates. Yeah. And why, why, aren't, why aren't the older dentists, why, why aren't they hiring the, uh, these young graduates? And... It's, 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 it's where they need to go, but Howard, I think it's, it's, it's what's between our ears. It's, it's... It's, 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 you know, we're, again, we were, most of us were trained going through school to be solo. We want to be entrepreneurs and we want to do it our way. We're control freaks by nature. And to learn how to work with other people is a skill set that can be learned, but, you know, it has to be practiced. You learn, have to learn how to, how to build those relationships and learn how to, uh, you know, build, whether it's a partnership or you just want to bring associates in. But how do you do that the right way? How do you build a business that has a, a culture to it where instead of having just employees, you have stakeholders so you can actually have a real business. Well, that's what corporate is learning how to do besides all the other things that are able to leverage. You know, corporate is looking at this as an opportunity and they're taking these, these young docs and putting them into a system uh, just like, like, like McDonald's. I mean, McDonald's, you know, you can put a 60 year old kid in there with zits on their face, but the product that comes out, you know, is consistent, right? Well, 
I'm not, I'm not, I'm not making dentistry analogous to McDonald's, but I'm saying in some respects, corporate's doing that and they're doing it pretty darn well. And they're not, you know, you, you, they're not going away. So if they're not going away, then what do we learn from them? How can we adapt who we are in our practice and say, well, how can I model some of that? How can, you know, rather than just putting our head in the sand and going, well, I'm just going to gut it out here. I'm not going to play ball with them. I'm just going to be solo here. Well, you know, look around. It's, it's happening. It's all around. You, you can't continue to be a solo practitioner if you're going to plan on practicing many more years and still keep your head above water. It's not going to happen. But David, you're, you're a numbers guy if there ever was one. And you're saying it's not McDonald's. McDonald's is publicly traded. None of McDonald's can can add new stores out of their own profits generated from cash. Yep. But I, I don't see any of these corporate dental trains publicly traded. I see them growing their sales by growing their debt sheet. I mean, they want to add a million dollars of revenue. They go buy a practice doing a million dollars. I, I, I don't see how that's a viable business. I mean, and I've we're old enough. We lived through the first round of crashes, Orthodontic Centers of America yep. and a dozen on NASDAQ. And the ones today can't go public. So it, how is it really, I mean, you're a numbers guy, look, look, cash flow, are they, are they growing from internally generated cash on existing operations or are they just growing with, with debt? Well, I don't, you know, I don't, I'm not privy to, to their balance sheets, so I'm not sure exactly, you know, what, what their model looks like, but I, I, I just, I, I just see that in the, in this current era that we have that I, I don't see them going away. As you said, we saw the first round, you know, some years ago where they, where they crashed and burned. But I just I think I think the whole healthcare industry has changed um, forever, uh, and, and and you and I would and others would say not for the better, but it is what it is. Uh, you know, as you manage care, decreased reimbursements, uh, control uh, the whole Obamacare thing that was ramrodded through. It's changed everything forever. It's, we're not never going back. So whether 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 you look at corporate or just look at a private group practice model, I think. I, that's the way one's going to have to go and you know, take away some of the lessons from corporate, uh, but I think you can build your own model. But it has to be based on, on so many business principles that most dentists are lacking or not availing themselves of because they try to wear all the hats. I mean, I, I didn't say you try to wear all the hats. You don't know how to bring the right people in. You don't have to build a structure. That's what corporate's doing. So I, I, don't, I, I can't really answer your question about how they're, how they're building. Uh, well, well do you think it's a red flag that not one – there's 340 – corporate dental chains not one of them is publicly traded do i think it's a red flag it, it's it's possible it's possible howard i'm, I'm not I'm, I'm hearing what you're saying it's possible but yeah. uh, they, they certainly are, are are rolling up a lot of clinics today and i think i think from that standpoint if there was ever an opportunity to take some equity off the table if a practice that you want us to sell or sell fraction thereof i think now's the time i think the value of practices is is on the decline or will be on the decline by the way, you can buy your book on Amazon, and it has only five-star ratings. You can buy it. It's only $9.95. And customers who bought your book also bought Fred Joyle's Becoming Remarkable, uh, How to Build the Dental Practice of Your Dreams, uh, who we podcast. We podcast both those guys. And my book, Uncomplicated Business, All It Takes People Time and Money. And uh, your, uh, your reviews on this book are all stellar. Did you write all those reviews yourself, or are those all your, <laughs> are those all your cousins? Yeah, exactly. Well, you know, you do what you have to do to get a best seller out there, right? <laughs> did, you, did you throw a big barbecue in your backyard with all your, all your cousins and aunts and uncles that, okay, you got to write a review to get it? But all your reviews are outstanding. Um, you, you obviously have known a lot of dentists who have um, made a lot of mistakes in real estate. What, 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 what lessons did you learn from them? And Because some of these dentists are like, about a third of the dental school class has dentists in their family tree, whether it's dad, mom, aunts, uncles. And a lot of them are hearing from their dad, oh, stick with what you know. You know dentistry. You don't know crap about any of this stuff. And my dentist friend at the study club, he lost all his money in condominiums. Are, you hear that. And sure. you, you've seen those mistakes. So, so what if, what if my, one of my uh, homies listened to this and he's 30 years old and, and that's all his dad told him, stick with what you know. Yeah, well, you know, that's what that's what my CPA back in 1986 told me. I, I had been out of school three years. I had, I don't know, I had eight or eight or nine properties at that point. I went in for my review with him, and he said that very same thing. He was a dent. He was a, a CPA for dentists. You know, one, one of those those firms who who love themselves. And he looked at my my tax return and was going through these properties I had acquired, and he said, you know, David, this is fine. You better just say what you know. Exactly what he said, and. 
what I would say is, is people that give you that advice, I'm not saying not to listen, but, but you also have to understand where, where are they in their life? Are they still on the treadmill? Have they figured out how to get free? And I looked at him and, and, and the next year I had a different CPA. A CPA has been with me now 30 years and understands about real estate and transactions and business. This guy was just, you know, just running, running uh, uh, the tax returns. What I would say to people who, who, who are getting advice to, to stick with what you know, obviously that's, that's the first place and that's part of what I talk about in my Freedom Blueprint. I mean, take your, your dental practice, that's your primary asset. That's what you do know, you should know better than anything else and leverage that in the right way to make that a, a real cash flowing asset. But plan B is having outside. Look, real estate, you can get burned, uh, and a lot of people did get burned because they went out and did it the wrong way. The mistakes they make uh, is, again, trying to do it all yourself. Uh, so you go to a, a real estate seminar on the weekend, or you know a real estate broker, a doctor, uh, I know the market well, I can get you into a great deal, and you buy your first rental house, and they get you a contractor, and then you become what I call the accidental landlord. You should never have been there. You should never be landlord. That's a, that's a whole other business in and of itself. You've got to learn some basic principles of how the market cycles and, and, and what assets to buy and what geographic area. Um, those, to me, those are the keys. There's so much opportunity in real estate to do it the right way because it's, it's local versus Wall Street, which, which you know, I don't know how, how you have any control over that at all. You can, you can actually have control over real estate, but you have to be plugged in with where the market is. And the way I've done that over my life and what I try to do in Freedom Founders is bring that market, bring that pulse of the market the right information, the right people, you know, so, it's, so it's speed of information, it's speed of implementation, not trying to earn, earn that PhD, but getting involved with the right people who can show you how to do it so you don't get burned, whether the market's going up or the market's going down. So is your book on Amazon, is it available in audio? Uh, it is not. Let me, let me tell you something I learned from a speech from Jeff Bezos. Now over 50% of the books are audio, so I went back and I sat down on Skype, because it has a great right. taping sound file, read my book in five and a half hours, put it on Amazon. It's actually outselling the print book. So we're Generation Nexters, but the millennials and the baby boomers, yeah. they listen to audiobooks while they're commuting, while they're on the treadmill, while they're cleaning the house. So you need to, um, uh, and, and then also what I'm real excited about is, you know, Dental Town, we started with the message boards, and we did online CE, then we need classified ads. Um, the next feature up, uh, is audiobooks. So you have your podcasts, but uh, then they could sit there and just do the, uh, the, the audiobook. So that would be something uh, you might want to think about. Good, good tip. Good tip. Thank you. Also, I want to ask, um, what, what's the difference for my homies going to, you got two websites, you got freedomfounders.com and you got dentistfreedomblueprint.com. What's the difference between freedomfounders.com and dentistfreedomblueprint.com? When they get to their office, in sure. another few minutes. Which one of them websites should they go and what's the difference between the two? Well, DennisFreedomBlueprint.com is the podcast website where if you go there, uh, every podcast is transcribed. So if they like to pull down a transcription, they can, they can pull it. They can see all of the podcasts there on one site uh, if they want to do it that way. Freedom Founders is the website for the actual uh, mastermind community. If they want more information about the mastermind, what we do there, uh, that's, that's that one. I've got one other one that might be helpful to them, Howard, and that would be uh, planbdentist.com. That's planbdentist.com. And that would take them to a web-based tool that we created on how much do I need to retire. It's using Stephen Covey's principle of reverse engineering, determining what you need to live your lifestyle if you had all your debt or what do you need? And then developing a plan based off that. So it's an easy to use tool at planbdentist.com. And you mentioned Stephen Covey, and you said your hobbies were uh, tennis, snow skiing, bicycling. Stephen Covey just passed away from a mountain biking accident. Yeah, I'm I'm, uh, I'm more risk averse today. You know, I used to do that stuff, but uh, I value my health, and so uh, my bicycling is more road bike trips. Uh, I love to go and do that in in Europe. We're taking a trip to to Spain this year, which which will be biking there. Uh, uh, same thing with skiing. I like a lot of my life, but uh, you know, I won't do the crazy stuff anymore because. Uh, um, I, I, I love I love I love to be love to be able to be viable and uh, you know keep playing tennis and do the stuff I like to do. So yeah, there's a whole thread on Dental Town about uh, bicycling and the accidents and the uh, yeah. people ran over. One of the dentists on Dental Town who does Iron Man. I mean, he was uh, basically ran over and left for dead in Canada, and it took him a year to recover. And uh, it's a uh, yeah. it, it, God, it's a tough.
Um, you you um, talk a lot about mastermind groups. What 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 is your favorite mastermind group? And and explain a lot. A lot of these kids might not even they've never been to a mastermind group. What is a mastermind group? Well, you know the, the word mastermind group is it's thrown around a lot. So there are, are different iterations of mastermind groups. I, I think a real mastermind group is a small enough group where each person of that group, it's, it, it's, it's a group of like-minded entrepreneurs. It can be from the same industry, but I think it's better if it's more business. That's what I like, business, marketing operations, uh, the things that everybody needs, whether you're in dentist, dental practice or you're in real estate. But it's a, it's a group of like-minded people that come together on a regular basis. So there's gotta be a good facilitator. And you get to get in front of this group of people that you get to know, you get to build relationships there so you can open up and actually be a little bit vulnerable and talk about the things that you're not so good at, the, the, the concerns you have, the questions you have, or maybe it's even the opportunities that you have in front of you and put it out to this group of other wise people who have different experiences in life and get feedback. I, I love going to masterminds because I've, I'm always full of ideas. It's like, I'm gonna do this, I'm gonna do that. And when I take my ideas and I put them out in front of a, of a group that I trust, and I get the feedback, I get instant clarity. You know, is this, is this a good path to go down right now? Is it a good path to go down later? Is it a path to go down, but I need to turn left or turn right? That's what a good mastermind group does for you. And so I think it's wise everybody, in person, they're great, but I'm even a part of a, a virtual mastermind group. So you don't even have to travel if you can find the right kind of group. But be a part of some kind of group that you meet on a regular basis where they hold you accountable, you, you put your dreams, your, your vision, and people will you know, help drive you through it. Uh, without that, without a deadline on, on where you want to go in life, uh, you're, you're not going to get there. It's just not going to happen. Well, they, they always say that you're uh, eagles fly with eagles, turkeys fly with turkeys, and that you're basically a summation of the five people you spend all the most time with. And right. uh, so when you're hanging out with five people who are, think the sky is falling and all that stuff is, is uh, very different. You, you always talk about creating multiple passive income streams, but are all these passive income streams in, with you, what you're talking about, in real estate? Everything I do is in real estate, Howard. Yeah, but that doesn't mean someone has to be limited to that. I mean, if you've got other, other opportunities in other businesses, uh, like you've done, uh, to create and streams, and that works just as well. But for me, it's it's all in real estate. I, I just I'm a believer in real estate. It's worked for me over 35 years, and uh, I'll continue to, to go down that road. And and will you talk about? You, you said starting with single family. Um, mm -hmm. I suppose that just means divorced people, uh, single family homes. That's just <laughs> divorced people. That was, that was my dumb joke. But that was okay, good. so it was, so single family. You say is the intro intro level is a single family home. Yeah, well, because, because again, you know, they're they're easy to evaluate. Uh, you know, everybody, most everybody's lived in a home. You need to know what a home looks like. Uh, it's easy to get comparable sale data. It's easy to evaluate income streams, rents. It's easy to evaluate what the maintenance maintenance costs are. Uh, that's a great place to learn. That's where I cut my teeth. That's where I learned uh, everything about finance that I appreciate today. I learned I learned business skills. I learned about the legal aspects uh, of documents. I learned how to negotiate. So many things that have helped me not just in real estate, uh, but in everything in business, in, in, in dental practice, in, in negotiating, putting together documents. Real estate has opened the door for me in so many areas. So yeah, start with single family. And if you, if you have, a, if you have a, a, like, a like for getting in, involved in, in, in different asset classes, you know, there's ways to do that, but it, you know, it involves more active participation. Uh, you know, I, I still like to have some level of control in what I do. I can control what I do with single family. If I need to get involved in something bigger, then I'm going to be pooling my money to some extent with other people. That's fine, but you better know who you're putting your money with because that's where, where problems can occur. And talk a little bit about uh, liquidity. You know, you never want to let your money get too far from cash. Mm -hmm. there, in single family, there's different incomes. There's low income. There's three bedroom, two bath. There's, there's lifestyles, rich and famous. Which, which, which uh, in that single family do you think is the best, the sweet spot? And talk about liquidity a little bit. Sure. Yeah, I think the sweet spot uh, in, in every market is what I call the affordable market. So the affordable market is not low income. Uh, affordable market is going to be, I like three bedroom, two bath, uh, two car garage. That's that's the cookie cutter. Uh, price points will be different in different markets, but, but that's the market when there's a downturn that everybody drops into. Uh, mobile homes, double wides on two acres, which we have a lot of in Texas, and there's other parts of the country that have them. Uh, another great sector, a very much of an affordable housing area. So you want to be in an area where you wouldn't, 
wouldn't have any apprehension about sending your 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 daughter or your wife down the street, you know, on Saturday night. If you have that kind of, if that kind of adversity to that, then then I wouldn't go there. Uh, that's more of a, of a of a different business class. In terms of liquidity, um, it you know it depends on it depends on how you how you finance how you finance your, your real estate. But you know if you're part of a community that that where everybody's investing in real estate it's easy to have liquidity my point being that i have a lot of a lot of notes receivable that i've i've, I've created or purchased uh, part of my income streams you know i could sell those in you know I, with one call i can sell those. i do not have to go to a bank to to liquefy my assets uh, going to going to banks i think is dangerous unless you're buying your home or maybe your practice but investments uh, i don't use bank leverage i use i use private capital that's what allows me to stay liquid uh, and still leverage when I want to leverage. That is a very interesting. And um, and also, podcasters tend to be young. So they're, they're t have you noticed that on your show? Or yes, yes, very so, much. So what, what what have you noticed on the feedback? You've done a lot of podcasts in in dentistry. What have you What have you noticed on your feedback as far as like a demographic or anything? Have you noticed anything? Yeah, I would say it's it's definitely thirty and under. Uh, I, I you know the anybody uh in a, in a at a later age in life is more of an anomaly. So I think it's, it's 30 and under is, is probably the, the, the greatest bulk of our listeners. Yep. So, so what you're, uh, and okay. Um, I want to say another question um, about, it seems like about three in 10 women dentists in uh, the graduate dental school marry a male dentist in their class. They seem to have an extra bias about debt because they say, well, I married my husband and he's also 300,000. So combined, yeah. We're six hundred thousand, and the way they talk about it, they almost think like it was a bad, you know, that that it was a negative, that they each have student loan debt. Do, do you think marrying a dentist in your senior class and walking out with double debt? Do you think that's a bad deal or a good deal? <laughs> that's that. That's just one of those where I say it depends. You know, it 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 really depends upon upon. You know, if you and, and your your new spouse have the same core values, uh, how you're going to handle that debt, you know, what's what, how you plan to work that debt off, how you're going to go about your your practice, are you going to practice separately, or are you going to try to go in together? Uh, you know, what what what's your what's your emotional makeup? I mean, there's so many parts of that. So for me, just to come out carte blanche and say, well, that's a bad idea. I mean, it kind of sounds like a bad idea, but I'm not saying it couldn't work with the right people. But that's a heavy debt load to take on. How soon are you going to start a family? I mean, what you know, all these things you have to factor into the game plan for someone who's coming out of school with that kind of debt, getting married. Uh, you know, it's just I think I think some some real structure is going to need to be put in place and get some help. Do, you know, defining what what life and practice is going to look like over the next two, three, four, five years, and and build a plan. Otherwise, that that debt will continue to be a ball and chain. Okay, I want to ask you another uh, and um, another huge question I always see on the message boards is um. I'm buying this practice, and let's say it's uh, four to six hundred thousand. Uh, do I want? But he's also selling the real estate for another four to six hundred thousand. But I have the option; mm -hmm. I don't have to buy the real estate. I can lease. A lot of people always ask, um, or they say they're going to start a scratch practice, okay. and they go to a small town, and they could rent, a, you know, a space right next to a grocery store, or they could buy the land and building. So it, it, it's uh, should they own the real estate of their own dental office or should they lease and rent? Yeah, I, I think again, it's gonna depend, Howard. It's gonna depend on what, what the cost of, of buying that particular space or that building or a or, or, or new build out, whatever, whatever they're doing, what's, what's the cost factor? Because most of the time you can lease for less than the cost of, of ownership. Uh, now, what you can do is many times you can negotiate uh, that option on that real estate. So you can go into a lease and, and negotiate an option which gives you the best of both worlds. You can, you can have, have lease payments, you can, have, you can have, even have lease payments that are credited towards the purchase. So you can even have, you know, like you're amortizing the principal down. There's ways to structure that if you're the right party that owns the real estate. So I think, again, it, it, it depends. But if I'm, if I'm new getting started in real estate and starting my practice, if I could lease, if I could lease with an option, to purchase that that real estate under under terms that that made sense or gave me some kind of a lock in formula for a few, few years, I think that gives you gives you the best of both worlds. So I, I would probably try it that way rather than locking some real estate, particularly if that real estate is being bought in some markets today where we're back at the height of uh, peak of the market. You know, you got to be careful about you know where that real estate is. Is it in a strip center somewhere? What's what's the what are the demographics of that area? 
I mean, there's just a lot of factors to look at before you lock into to that real estate. But you don't you don't have to own the real estate. You can you can own real estate outside the practice. If there's an opportunity to own the real estate and it makes sense from a number standpoint, then absolutely, absolutely. So if somebody's listening to this and actually has a specific proposal and wants some professional help, where would you tell them to turn to? Who, well, could, who could look at that price and contract and city and 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 tell them what they think of yeah. that deal? Well, yeah. In terms in terms of you know running numbers, I mean, there's there's you've got great forums on Dentaltown with uh, with with moderators there that that talk about you know leasing and and price sale. I think in terms of your local market, you know, you want to find you want to find somebody in your local market who who knows real estate, a broker who can at least look at look at price points, but. You know, anybody with knowledge of real estate today with all the information we have available on the internet can pretty well lock in and see what, what price points are in different markets around the country. But yeah, I, I, I would, I'm going on Dentaltown, some of the forums there that, that talk about uh, practice transitions and, and purchasing and leasing. Uh, there's some great threads there with some great people that I think can sort of weigh into making that decision. And that's, that'd be an important thing for someone to do. Who, who's your favorite, Tony, on that? Do you have any favorites? Uh, Who's who's the, who's the guy who's the guy that, that that talks about leasing? I can't think of his name, but there's there's one one, one particular moderator who who who's kind of uh, the negotiator for leases. Um, and then there's the CPA. What's his? Is it George uh, George Vale? Vale, George yeah, Bale. yeah, George Vale. Uh, but I can't think of the guy who who who's who's out there a lot um, and helping uh, townies uh, look at look at leasing and negotiating that kind of thing. So those are two people that I've I've seen that that probably have a a, a good uh, ability to make make uh, some assertions. Well, your uh, wealth, uh, any, any other things? Uh, I, I don't think I'm smart enough to ask you what questions. Do you have any other things you want to say? Or? I, I, th I think, you know, going back to what we, we talked about a minute ago about, about, you know, the young docs coming out, out, of, out of school, the millennials, is that, is that, you know, I would, and I know you've got a great heart for helping them as well, and that's why, why you do the podcast, and there's so many that you're trying to reach out and help, and they're coming out of school with all this debt. I just, I just think it's so important that, that they find good mentors and 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 maybe find a good good doctor, a good practice to apprentice in before they jump into something. Get you know get get over their head in in practice. There's, there's, there's just less margin today to make errors, and with all that debt coming out of school, I don't want to see them get get beat up. Uh, so you know, find the right people, find mastermind groups, get on forums, utilize Dental Town, utilize what what's there. Uh, get feedback. Don't be afraid to ask for help. Don't think that just because you know you you skated through school, and I'm not necessarily saying everybody did, but you, you know that, that you should be able to do it all on your own. You know, be vulnerable, ask for help, get get guidance, because uh, otherwise you can you can get get go in the wrong direction in practice, and and it's hard to, hard to recoup once you do that. Well, hey, I want to uh, thank you from the bottom of my heart. You know, I, I kicked off that podcasting section with uh, doing my own show hoping that it would uh others would follow and my god you followed in spades and you got 60 shows up there and it's just amazing content and uh it's guys like you that make dental town i mean i i'm like uh a copper wire you know it's the content is from you unicorns like you that just keep sharing great amazing content and i so wanted to have you on the show there's i hear so many great things about your show i listen to your show um thank you so much for all that you do for uh dentistry and uh and what would be the best way for them to contact you if they want to find out more yeah uh, the www.freedomfounders.com website would be the best best place to go howard and how, how old is that um freedom founders what, what year did you start that yeah we're really at four years 20, 2012 2012, 2012. Four, four years yep all right, buddy. Well, uh, thanks for all you do, and I hope you have a rocking hot day, and I hope you have fun. And you're going to Spain? Going to Spain in September, yep. Right on. Okay. Well, I'll talk to you later. All right. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. All right, buddy. Bye-bye.